Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. I want to thank our sponsor, audiobooks.com, for underwriting this program. Audiobooks.com, you can sign up and your first book will be free. One of the things I like about audiobooks.com, and I have sometimes three or four books going on it at a time, is that it picks up wherever I have left off as I change devices. So if I'm listening in the car and I go inside and pick up my cell phone and I want to continue listening to the book, it knows where I stopped. It's very smart technology and picks up right where I left off so I don't have to have a certain device with me. I can just switch and change and adapt wherever I am to continue listening uh, to the book, whether I'm at the gym, at the office, at home. Audiobooks.com, your first book is free. Our book today is Diet Cults. Matt Fitzgerald is the author, and he has written several books in the genre of uh, ultra fitness. He's written for Ultra Running Magazine, Men's Fitness, Triathlete Magazine, TriSports.com, SlowTwitch.com. Lots of praise for this book on diet cults. So we're going to be talking to him about this new, what I would call, macro approach to looking at uh, diets. He wants to more or less reject the idea that we need a specific diet and say there is a general approach to eating well and that is uh, the sensible thing to do. And he's going to describe that to us here in just a few minutes. Now, you've written uh, for Ultra Running Magazine, Men's Fitness, Triathlete Magazine. So you've been in the sports journalism business a long time and you've had a, a couple of bestsellers in the vicinity of, of uh, diets. And now this book, Diet Cults, is one that's interesting to me because you're saying a pox on all your houses that all of these various diets are, are uh, problematic. And you're taking a kind of macro view here in this book, uh, looking at uh, the various trends, fads, fashions when it comes to diet. And you're saying a lot of it's your waste of time. But let's begin with question one. What qualifies as a diet cult? The simplest definition of a diet cult is any diet that is based on the false idea that there's a single ideal diet for humans. Mm -hmm. If the diet makes that claim, you know, this is the only healthy way to eat or this is clearly the healthiest way to eat compared to all other ways of eating, then it's a diet cult. Okay. So would you say, uh, would Atkins qualify? Yes. Yes. And the raw foods diet and the paleo diet, right? Yep. It yeah. doesn't matter what the specific, you know, shtick of the diet is. If it, mm-hmm. if it makes that claim of, of uh, clear superiority, you know, it, it's my definition. I came up with it. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's <laughs> so not, you'll, you won't find it in the dictionary. But right. that, is, that is how I conceive mm-hmm. of it, yeah. And, and what is, uh, in contemporary culture, what is the kind of big diet of the moment, uh, the big fad diet? The two biggest right now are, uh, I think, the paleo diet and gluten-free diets. Okay. And uh, raw foods, is that in there too? No, it's not nearly as popular. I mean, of course, everyone eats a certain amount of raw foods, but if you're, you know, if you're in the raw food diet cult, then you eat raw foods exclusively. Um, And that's, uh, that is a very small population. And in fact, um, the best evidence suggests that virtually no one stays on that diet for mm-hmm. more than a short period of time. It's very, very difficult to sustain. I love the story you tell about your friend Bernie who took on the raw foods diet, and after about uh, two weeks he was saying, well, you know, a cheeseburger wouldn't be you know, really cheating that badly, would it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's exactly what will happen. It seems like a good idea before you start, and then you find yourself just thinking about food all day long and you know, having difficulty concentrating and, uh, you know, wondering if you made a terrible mistake. (laughs) Well, something I wondered uh, when I was reading about the raw foods diet and the use of, um, you know, blenders and things like that, uh, juicers, uh, I would think that given their focus on natural, that that would be wrong. You know, shouldn't you be chewing it yourself? Right. You know, that, that's, that's the thing. If you, look, if you look at any of these diets, you start to see that um, their doctrine and, and some of the rules are rather arbitrary. 
Um, you know, for example, you know, your example is good. The, the paleo diet is the same way, where it's based on the idea that we shouldn't eat anything, you know, that, that as a species we haven't eaten for many millennia. Mm-hmm. But there are lots of other ways, you know, so, it, you know, the, the basic rules of that diet are don't eat grains and don't eat dairy mm-hmm. and don't eat legumes, alcohol, all these things that entered the diet, you know, post-agricultural revolution. Mm-hmm. But our diet has changed in a lot of other ways that they, the paleo diet advocates completely ignore. For, for example, the different ways of cooking and, and heating foods uh, that, that are modern. They have no problem with any of that. Or you, almost in the past, in the, you know, in the Paleolithic era, almost every meal came after intense activity, mm-hmm. and there's no focus on that in the paleo diet doctrine. Or how about storage of foods in uh, plastic containers, things like that. Mm-hmm. Those are, that's a thing you could actually make a big deal out of, but... The paleo diet doesn't make a big deal out of that. So every diet has that, that sort of arbitrary element. Well, I think that's a good point about the paleo diet because they ran down their food, and so <laughs> you get a lot of exercise in, in getting your food in that, um, at least historically, right? Yep. Yeah, our diet has changed in, in all kinds of ways, and, and the context in which it exists, um, that you, you just can't go back to the past, you know, the paleo diet just tries to pick a, a few ways to um, really be able to live, it, live in a fantasy where you are going back in time, but it, it really is a fantasy. So most people get attracted to these cults in the same way they get attracted to psychological cults? They just like to be part of something? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're fairly different. I try to, you know, because sociologists get upset when people play fast and loose with the term cult. So mm-hmm. I, I try to make it clear in the book that a diet cult is a distinct phenomenon from a re- religious cult. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the parallels are clear. You know, the first one being that, you know, if you were to join, you know, some kind of religious cult, um, it would be based on the idea that that cult represented the, the only path to salvation or enlightenment or whatever. Well, mm-hmm. the diet cults do the same thing with respect to health. You know, you mm-hmm. have to eat this way to be healthy. But, you know, there are, there are other parallels as well. Uh, the way people identify deeply with uh, a particular way of eating. You know, you are joining a community, um, and, you know, there's, there can be some tribalism surrounding that. Uh, some, and it really is, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an identification and even a moral compass for mm-hmm. people. Um, you know, that's why you see a lot of the, you know, the heated debates between different dietary factions that you think, wow, why are you getting so upset because someone, you know, eats by a different set of rules? But it's because there is that, you know, uh, people identify with it, they're, they're joining a group and even getting a, a, a moral compass out of belonging to that group. Well, that's, that's a good point. There, there is a, a kind of morality wrapped up in, in some of these uh, diet cults. They're better than you. Yeah, there's a, a great line from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche that I quote in the book. He said, all prejudices begin in the intestines. <laughs> 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 and, and, you know, that's even true if, you know, if you're just someone who just eats like an average American. Mm-hmm. But if you see someone eating a food that you think is, like, totally disgusting, mm-hmm. You might say something like, ooh, how can you eat that? Yeah. And there's, there is a sort of judgment, even in that, you know, it seems innocuous enough, but we sort of can't help it. And there's, there's some interesting research by a Yale psychologist named Karen Wynn, where she's looked, she studies infant morality, and she's found that uh, infants as young as 11 months old uh, show a clear um, tendency to judge, in this case it's puppets, uh, but we can just say, to judge others who uh, exhibit uh, different dietary preferences. So if a puppet likes a food that the baby hates, mm-hmm. the, the baby will, will hate the puppet. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the stuff is hardwired. Uh-huh. Well, I, I think in my own experience, uh, having spent some time in Africa where I was exposed to unusual diets, at least by my American standard, of course, like uh, fried termites, for instance, which I uh-huh. which I actually tried, and you know, not not too bad, really. Just in your mind, it's so bizarre that uh, you know it's hard to get. It's like eating rattlesnake; you can't get the snake out of your head. Uh, right. You know, it doesn't in and of itself taste terribly different from chicken, but it still is in your head as a snake, and it's hard to get beyond that. So the uh, 
Anyway, going back to your book, I think that you make a very good case for uh, all of us getting kind of pulled into these uh, cultic-like diets, and, and but we have a hard time staying on them, even though we might like it. We might like raw foods, but like your your friend Bernie, or at least like the idea, you know, he's losing weight. He's actually making progress in the way he wants to, but he can't ultimately stick with it. Yeah, there's kind of a double-edged sword there, because the, the, the diet cults exist for a reason, and that's because they, they do make it easier uh, to change your diet, you know, to, to make that initial change. Um, because, you know, let's face it, it, it's hard to eat healthy in, in modern America. Um, just so yes. many advertisements for delicious-looking fast food burgers and stuff. So you really have to swim against the stream, and, and the diet cults help with that by, by – um, giving you like a sense of certainty, like you know, an absolute mm-hmm. uh, doctrine. Um, you know, it just—it's comforting to believe that you've discovered you know the answer, and you can just shut your brain off and not worry about it anymore. And the fact that there is a community of, of like-minded eaters that you can you can join and become a part of—all all these things uh, to make it a little bit easier to to bypass the fast food drive-through window on the way home from mm-hmm. from work every day. But then you know, once you're once you've made those changes, what, what, what happens is that you're, you're now out of sync with familiar ways of eating or just, you know, ways of eating that are sort of culturally normal uh, for whatever, you know, culture you, you happen to belong to. So, you know, it becomes hard to just sit down and have a meal with, with a friend. Um, and I think that's where it becomes difficult to sustain or you just, you know, you start to miss things that you grew up eating and really never did you any harm, but they just defy the doctrine of, of the diet cult you've joined. And, and those things, I think, you know, start to, um, you know, just press upon the dieter over time to the point where they're like, you know what, forget this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to what I used to eat. Well, you look very healthy. I, I see your picture here on the book jacket, and, you know, you, you look like a very fit man. Uh, what is your diet? Yeah, so you know, my diet I would describe as agnostic healthy eating, um, mm-hmm. which is, uh, it's basically, agnostic healthy eating is eating in a culturally normal way with very, very high quality standards. Um, and a lot of people do eat this way. There was just, there was no name for it. And what I'm trying to do is, is take a little bit of what's best about the diet cult and apply it to um, healthy ways of eating that are supported by mainstream nutrition science, but mm-hmm. are also, you know, practiced by people in the r- real world and, and, and are sustainable because they don't require that you, you know, drink the Kool-Aid of, of some, you know, dogma or, or uh, enforce rather arbitrary restrictions. In the book, I talk about how uh, elite endurance athletes, the vast majority, majority of them, tend to eat this way because they, they have to eat healthy in order to uh, support the level of performance that you know, they need to sustain. But they're not in, they don't need that extra motivation because their motivation is to win. You know, their livelihood depends on yes. performance. So they need to eat well, but they're, 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 they're going to eat well in the simplest, uh, least restrictive way possible. And as part of my job, I, I, I analyze the diets of a lot of these people, Olympic marathoners and mm-hmm. Ironman triathlon winners, and very, very few of them are you know, gluten-free or vegan or, or, or you name it. Most, if you just looked at uh, one of their food journals, it would just look like an American diet. But if you look more closely, you'll start to notice, boy, there's actually a lot of vegetables in there, mm-hmm. and boy, there really aren't a lot of sweets or fried foods in there. Um, and, and that's really the essence of agnostic healthy eating, and that's the way I eat. So they, the, the vegetable category is first, and then fruits follows? That's what they yeah, eat most so the of? Way, the way I work, I, I, you know, I try to formalize it a bit so that um, it's something that you know, anyone who reads the book can easily kind of replicate for themselves. So I break the whole universe of foods down into 10 basic types, rank them in order of quality, Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, vegetables are are the highest quality category of foods. Fried foods are the lowest. Nothing is forbidden. You know, you can eat fried foods, but the the one rule that you need to follow is that you need to eat uh, each food category more often than any any category that's lower in quality. So more vegetables than fruits, more fruits than nuts, seeds, and healthy oils, and, and so on down the line. So that, you know, you can have that fried chicken every now and then. Uh, but just it should be a, a small part of your diet. 
Well, I like that. I like that uh, uh, table that you have there. It's easy to follow. That's one of the problems with a lot of diet books. Is I, I'm like your friend Bernie. I start looking at, at things and seeing all these recipes, and it looks complicated, you know. And, and yours is simple. Just eat vegetables, eat fruits. Uh, you can have some meat. You can have uh, – uh, mix it up with some fish and, you know, be sensible. But uh, I actually am fairly in line with what you have there, except I have a, a little more ice cream up top, I think. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and burgers. But burgers, I think, uh, are not that terrible as long as I always get extra tomatoes and, and uh, you know, lettuce and, and kind of pile the vegetables on there. <laughs> so so I'm uh, getting a little a little bit of each, and I don't get, you know, the biggest meat. I try to, uh, and then I get a, a whole wheat bun often if it's available. So I at least try to lean in that direction. Yeah, th- that's just it. You know, if you look at something like a, a burger, you can you can see the difference between agnostic healthy eating and some of the diet cults. You know, because mm-hmm. if you're if you're low carb, you can't have the bun. You know, the bun mm-hmm. is just gone. There's mm-hmm. no no option. You have to have your burger without the bun. If you're uh, on the paleo diet. You can't have the bun or the cheese. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're uh, a vegan, you can't have the burger. <laughs> you can have the bun and the veggies. You know what I'm saying? So yes. there's something that you just simply can't have uh-huh. in this all-American food if you're on you know, any, almost any of these diet cults. But if you're an agnostic, healthy mm-hmm. eater, you can have your cheeseburger. You just raise the quality standards. Mm-hmm. So uh, it might be a bison burger or just mm-hmm. you know, very lean, uh, high-quality beef. Preferably, preferably even grass-fed if you can afford that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it's still a burger. It's still a slab of meat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can still have the bun, but it should be a whole whole grain bun. Um, and yes, pile on pile on the veggies. So you can you can have your burger, um, but you're just it's a healthy burger. Right. Well, if 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 I look at uh, something that always strikes me as I look at uh, from time to time, you know, historical pictures of let's say. Uh, uh, high school annuals, for instance, from 1920s or something. And the thing that's striking right away is you look at uh, high school students of the 1920s and 30s, and they're all thin. You know, they're all, they're yep. all uh, by comparison to today, their faces are thin. So what ultimately, in your opinion, has caused, uh, you know, this weight gain for the population as a whole? In a nutshell, it is simply that we eat more food mm-hmm. than we used to. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. If you look at um, graphs of you know, average daily caloric intake in the American diet, mm-hmm. uh, superimposed on a graph of average body weight, there, there is a perfect correspondence. And any good scientist will tell you, you know, a correlation doesn't mean causation. But right. um, usually when you see trends that have that kind of obvious cause effect potential you know the association is causative so we're, we're simply fatter because we're, we're eating more. more food now you know you will get those people who will try and you know drill down and say well it's because we're eating more carbs that's the problem or it's because we're eating more fat that's the problem um, yes and no the, the the fundamental problem is that we're eating more it's just uh, we, we it's easier to inflate the amount of calories you're taking in if you do eat certain kinds of foods. So yes, you know we're eating more sweets, you know, drinking more soft drinks. Mm-hmm. So there's more sugar in the diet, but that doesn't mean sugar is the essence of it. You'll have those people out there who say, you know, you can eat as much as you want as long as you never eat any sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not really it. It really is just a. It's just you know, kind of simple. Simple math. We're we're just putting more stuff down our gullets uh, than we used to. And yes, there's an emphasis on certain kinds of things, but um, you know, it's it, it's the calories. I think uh, I, I make this observation a, a lot. I think it's just because I'm a big person. I'm six five and I'm two hundred fifty pounds. And I'll go to some place like Chili's and I'll order Monterey chicken. And then whoever's with me is uh, maybe one hundred fifty pounds, and they order the same thing, and they get the same size meal as I get. Yep. You know, so the portion for them is much greater than it is, you know, for me. If this is sustaining me at my weight, uh, it's got to be putting weight on them, you know. Right. And that, that's, that's kind of the reason we are eating more than we used to is that uh, we are served bigger portions in, in restaurants. You know, what happened was, um, you know, the uh, – Restaurants and also, uh, you know, the producers of the foods we buy in supermarkets, uh, they're all in competition with each other. Mm-hmm. And 
um, through the industri- un- industrialization of food production, uh, you know, these competing brands would uh, try to provide more value. So they would lower prices and, you know, increase portions. So, you know, if you went out uh, to, you know, a, a restaurant in 1950 and ordered a steak dinner, uh, it would have been a much smaller dinner than if you in, did, you know, went to a steak restaurant and ordered the same meal in 2014. And there's pretty good research to show that that people just eat what's put in front of them. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you'd like to think that you are the master of your own destiny as as an eater, but by and large, we are a species of, of plate clearers. So as portion <laughs> yes. sizes increased, yes. we just simply started eating more. And even more than that, um, that sort of recalibration of, of what we considered a normal portion even followed us home so that when we cook at home mm-hmm. and, and serve meals to ourselves, we also serve bigger portions to ourselves uh, in 2014 than we did in 1950. Oh, that's very true. When I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, I was, you know, in my, my teenage years in the early 70s. And uh, even then, we ate most of our meals at home. Eating out was rare. You know, once, uh, once a month or so, we might actually eat out. It was a big event. Uh, otherwise, we ate at home. And what did we eat at home? Lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, lots of healthier uh, cuisine, I would say. And... Uh, and smaller portions, although as a teenage boy, of course, I was eating a lot, and my right. mother didn't particularly, uh, uh, you know, limit me, but then I was playing basketball and sports, and so there was uh, plenty of activity to eat it all up, to burn it up. Uh, so, yes, I think absolutely you're correct that it's uh, portion size is one of it, la- lack of activity for, for many of us uh, compared to, you know, the older days. And probably a, a greater um, bang for your buck in terms of the intensity of protein per ounce, or, or calories per ounce, I should say. Where a lot of things that you eat, uh, you know, certain foods, we, we've been able to engineer calorie bombs, and uh-huh. you know, humans are hardwired to have a preference for highly energy dense foods because it helped with our survival, you know, back in very primitive times when. Um, you know, the problem was not having too much food, but, but getting enough. So what, what was a, you know, adaptive survival mechanism, you know, 100,000 years ago is our worst enemy now, <laughs> where, yeah. where, you know, the more calories a food engineer can pack into a small package, the, the more we're likely to enjoy that food, and, um, you know, that leads to uh, overeating. Something you bring up in the book I find really fascinating. It reminded me of a study done. Um, uh, you you referred to a study done in Hawaii, and I remembered one done in Arizona on the uh, – well, they, they were called at the time the Papago Indians, but I know there's another name for them, something more modern and politically correct. But in any case, let's just say Indians of southern Arizona uh, were studied uh, along with their genetic cousins in Mexico, you know, the same – tribal genetics. Uh, and uh, the one, the group in Arizona ate a American diet, let's say, uh, if we, I mean, the worst of American diet, potato chips and you know, all, yeah. all the horrible things. And uh, their genetic cousins in Mexico lived the old lifestyle. They ate uh, cactus, nopalitos. They ate uh, uh, a very uh, hunter-gatherer sort of uh, uh, sort of diet. They also lived in the mountains. They walked, they exercised and all that. And, and of course, they found the ones in Mexico were healthier. They had uh, low cholesterol. They had low blood pressure. And um, so that was where I was first introduced to the idea of what you might call a genetic diet, something consistent with your historical evolutionary genes, if you can call it that. And, and you mentioned a similar study done in Hawaii where they took people out of their European diets and put them back in their traditional Hawaiian diets that existed before Europeans arrived. And those people lost weight and were healthier, et cetera. So right. does, does that make sense to you? Or is your argument, well, anybody put on those diets would do better? Yeah, um, it, uh, it, it really is more the latter because um, the, you know, we're all humans. And, mm-hmm. and, and most of our evolutionary history is shared. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, you know, beginning about 60,000 years ago, um, you know, 
the humans dispersed from Africa and spread out all over the planet. And, you know, further changes did occur. You know, dietary patterns uh, diverged, and there was a certain amount of adaptation. Uh, so, if, you know, if, if, you, if you were part of a, a, a people that ended up in Australia, you would have ended up eating in a different way than if uh, you ended up in, say, uh, you know, the, the modern U.K., your diet would be different, and so you would have adapted to that. And we see that in things like um, uh, lactose tolerance, you know, places where, uh, you know, dairy animals were domesticated and people started consuming their milk. Um, there would be genes that favored the ability to di digest lactose that you know, it remained into adulthood, whereas in other places where uh, dairy animals were not domesticated and, and used for their, for their milk, that, that didn't happen. Um, but those, those differences are fairly superficial. And for mm -hmm. the most part, uh, we have, as a species, we have this amazing adaptability uh, dietetically so that a person from any given culture can eat in a wide range of different ways. This, you know, there is a genetic leash that, you know, certain things we just can't do, but most of that stuff is shared. So, you know, if you, if you try to live on processed meat and soft drinks, uh, that, that diet is good for all ethnicities. <laughs> and and uh, by contrast, you know, more of a, an agnostic healthy eating approach with a, a balance of fruits, vegetables, um, you know, natural meats, fish, whole grains, that sort of diet. Uh, is also going to be healthy for for any ethnicity. Um, so th th there's certain things you'd want to pay pay attention to based on you know uh, your ethnic heritage, uh, mm -hmm. but they're they're sort of at the margins. Well, is there any, anything? My engineer Renee says that um, he's heard for many years that people who have uh, green or blue eyes are more tolerant of alcohol than people with brown eyes. Is there anything to that? Um, uh, as far as I know, I mean, uh, I, I never heard that. There mm -hmm. are there are cert definitely certain peoples that um, that there are known genes mm -hmm. uh, that relate to alcohol tolerance. But mm -hmm. as far as I know, they don't have any connection to eye color. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get back to the example of Native Americans, mm -hmm. um, in in most Native American populations, uh, alcohol was never. Uh, never became part of the diet as it did in, in most other parts of the world. So um, uh, alcohol has a much stronger effect on most people of uh, Native American ancestry. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons you see such a high rate of alcoholism, unfortunately, on, on, on reservations, is that mm -hmm. their bodies do process alcohol differently. So the, mm -hmm. those differences certainly do exist, and, and the genes underlying them, mm -hmm. uh, at least some of them, have been identified. Well, my ancestry is Irish. Is there anything about my ancestry that uh, I should, uh, you know, go back to? Anything I should go back to eating that would be good for me? No, you can you can do what you want. Uh, <laughs> 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 pretty much as an Irishman, because you're going to have you're going to have the ability, very likely, um, to tolerate dairy. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we have a legendary. I'm Irish too, Fitzgerald mm -hmm. being my last name. Uh -huh. Uh, legendary tolerance for alcohol. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. I have a whole chapter in, in Diet Cults on the potato, sort of yes. rehabilitating the uh, the reputation of the potato. Mm. It's It's been uh, uh, one of man, many unfairly vilified uh, natural mm. foods. And, of course, uh, the potato had a central place in, in the Irish diet uh, beginning in the 18th century. Yes. So if you if you've been avoiding potatoes because you've been told no no I never uh, I never gave up on them I've I've been right in there all along good for you <laughs> now when you fry them that becomes problematic yeah. however <laughs> yes I've been big on baked potatoes and uh, good for you and and fried but I've you know tried to keep that to a minimum and yeah. uh, and scalloped and about every way you can think of them uh, they've been a part of my because I'm a midwestern. Texas boy, and so meat and potatoes. That was our that was our, our cultural diet, you might say. Mashed potatoes, yeah. of well, course. Well, nothing too. wrong with potatoes. Uh, <laughs> you know, fried is very tasty. I, I'll have a I'll have a serving of French fries every now and then. But you know, there are plenty of people who just avoid them entirely. You know, yeah. thinking that even a 
a boiled potato is no good, and, and that's that's not true. Well, you go back to the cult diets, and you, again, you get this thing: don't eat white foods. <laughs> you know, I hear that from people. Don't t- take all the white foods out, and and you'll be better right. off. So that includes most fish, uh, uh, cauliflower. Yeah. See how silly some of these things are. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think everybody's looking for the silver bullet, the simple formula. What's a simple yeah. formula I can follow? And that's what I like about your book. It's very sensible, very wise, and it's followable. You, we, we can do this and be healthy. The, the, the parameters of agnostic healthy eating are pretty broad. So you can have two agnostic healthy eaters who don't eat any of the same foods. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're both obeying the same principles, but, you know, because they have different tastes, uh, you know, maybe come from different cultural backgrounds, you know, they, they eat in different ways. And that's one of the things that, that I, I think helps make it sustainable, is that you can, you can eat your way uh, within those parameters. It's not that anything goes. You know, you do have to obey, you know, one, one basic rule on the, you know, the, the high diet, diet quality thing. But it's very flexible. Well, Matt, thanks a lot for joining us today. The book is Diet Cults by Matt Fitzgerald. Wonderful read. I think all of uh, all of you on Good Books Radio will enjoy this, so pick it up, download it. I want to thank again our sponsor, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. Signing off for Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. <laughs>